Yeah, we've got a microphone over here, too. Uh, I'm Senator David Hartsatch from Iowa. There we go. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Iowa is a very rural, rural area, and uh, actually many, many uh, uh, people in our area don't even have access to uh, Internet. Surprisingly, I didn't realize that. But uh, my question is what, what would be required in terms of infrastructure uh, demands, and particularly hardware and software. I've been a major proponent in our state for thin client technology, moving away from uh, uh, the PC box on the desk to computer computing at a distance with nothing but a dumb terminal, which reduces those or, or whatever. Yeah, the, the, and what I was wondering about is, are there currently software tools out there, for instance, maybe Linux-based, uh, open source, uh, you know, which could reduce the cost uh, of, of software and hardware requirements, et cetera, or, or is all you need a, an internet access? Uh, there may be better and more technical answers to your question, but it seems to me that this is a perfect example of the path of the disruption. You know, like I said, it starts out not so good and starts out appealing to people who don't get the mainstream product as well or as affordably as they want. Well, a lot of folks who live in rural territory with declining enrollments are the perfect population for going online. And all you really need is the broadband access. Uh, and to get all the stuff out of the way that, you know, from the standpoint of policies and laws and regulations that make it difficult. But it's the perfect it's the perfect place to start by any any measure. And if if just getting broadband to the places we don't have it is the problem, that's one we can fix. I do. De detail part. Um, as far as the evolution of this happening, uh, do we foresee uh, still having the student, the 30 students, still having the teacher, each student having a headset, the computer in front of them in, in, a, in a cube, where they this might pacify the teachers. Not that I'm interested in pacifying teachers, but the evolution of this, uh, or do we see most of these students in individual? homes, individual, working strictly by themselves. How, how's the details of this? So even today, there are a variety of models. And one of the really important things that we have to keep in mind on innovation uh, is that it's not just replicating one model over and over again, but it's allowing these principles that exist in expanding student-centered learning. And so right now, I'd say less than half of the students are um, in models where it's full time and they're learning from home with a responsible adult and the teachers at a distance. The other half of the students are sometimes in schools, whether elementary, middle, or high schools, taking one, one or two classes. They're models where students are going to libraries or computer labs or media centers, and you've got uh, 50 kids taking 50 different classes, some of them dual enrollment, some of them credit recovery. There's a facilitator, a teacher on site, but they're all learning from teachers at a distance somewhere else. So there's a whole new model of using human capital, teachers, people, resources, and what students can do and where they can do depends really on some students need more student support and so they want to be in a location. Other kids want the flexibility of real anytime, any place learning from home or anywhere else. Yeah, I, I think uh, Susan's exactly right, but I, I just want to emphasize that I think, um, you know, there are many people, uh, families who would prefer sort of a uh, home situation or a situation that's not rooted in a school, right? So they'll take a whole curriculum and they won't have an actual school that they go to. That's fine. But I suspect that the vast majority of families would like for their kids to go to school. And, and so I think that the modal uh, solution in the future will be hybrids, uh, where you have schools that, in which the kids are taking uh, a, a large percentage of their classes online, but they actually go to school. And so there will be arrangements within the school, where, because the kids don't, don't have to be with, they're not learning like from a live teacher necessarily, they're learning most of what they're learning from the computer and from being online, right? And so there are many different ways to do this. I would say just let a thousand flowers bloom and see, see what works. But in many situations now, what they do is, is they have lots of kids uh, in a room. They're all on computers, and there's a teacher there, 
right? But the teacher doesn't have just 30 kids. The teacher might have 60 kids. Great, right? That's the substitution of technology for labor, right? Uh, in, in fact, uh, the school that I just visited a little while, rock, uh, little while ago, Rocket Ship in San Jose, which is doing a fantastic job educating low-income kids, uh, they have exactly that situation, and they save a lot of money by having the kids spend a certain number of hours on the computer. Uh, they don't need as many teachers to supervise them during that time. They save, and that money that they save, they use to provide tutoring for these kids who are falling behind, and that kind of personal attention wouldn't be possible, right, were it not for all the money they're saving as a result of the technology component. So there are a lot of different ways to do this, but I think uh, some sort of hybrid is probably the likely solution in the future for most kids. Maybe I have one more question. Uh, I'm Giselle Huff. Um, so the elephant is in the room is the um, fact that we're all going bankrupt. And, uh, you know, um, <laughs> states have a constitutional obligation to educate children, but they're going to run out of money like tomorrow. So this is something that we haven't really talked about. And Terry, you mentioned it in passing that um, some investments must be made. But you just spoke about rocket ship, where they're actually saving money and with an existing model, which is a hybrid model. And I, I'm just wondering whether um, what you think about the urgency that, in fact, this revolution is not only a matter of excitement, but a matter of necessity. Because how are we going to resolve this problem of educating children when we don't have any money to pay teachers? Well, I think that the meltdown is a real opportunity. You know, I mean, it is. Um, uh, 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 online uh, educational opportunities can be arranged in such a way that they reduce the cost of education, right? allow schools and districts to offer courses they could never offer otherwise. And so this is an opportunity to vastly extend the reach of technology. Right? The only fly in the ointment is that I think that because of the upfront infrastructure cost that these schools have, right, um, it's, uh, I think it's important to pay them as much as possible so that we can stimulate the supply side. Right? But still, uh, I think the meltdown is a real opportunity, and legislators should think about it very seriously as a way to extend the reach of technology. Let me just add, me just add quickly, it's not discussed much, but somewhere in the fall of 2008, the constant rise, the trajectory of spending more on K-12 in this country stopped. And I think it's safe to assert right now, even though no, no one wants to admit it, that there will never be never be another increase in spending on K-12. You just look at everything going on in the country and in the world. If you're in that industry, you ought to welcome a cap at today's level because it's never going to be any more, and the trick's going to be to figure out how do you get the results people are looking for within the resources you've got. Can I add one, one point to that? I think that what happens in, a, uh, in economic bad times is that there are tremendous pressures on legislators to move in and save the regular school districts and save their budgets, right? And so as a result, all the newfangled approaches like technology, like the Florida Virtual School and so on, uh, people start to think of them as luxuries, right, that we can't afford because we have to save the core. This is a mistake, right? I think it's important to see technology as a, a way of pursuing real innovation and, over the long term, real cost reduction and productivity increases. This is an opportunity. And on that rousing note, we'll bring it to a close. Thank you so much to our panelists. And I'm sure they'll stick around for a few minutes to uh, discuss further if you'd like to come up and speak with them. Thank you so much for being here.